public respects. The latest on services in Scotland for the late Queen Elizabeth II. Title IX. Will public comments keep the Biden administration from implementing its agenda on gender? We're at the White House. Terrorist threat. An alarm is raised about Afghan evacuees in the U.S. who weren't properly vetted. We report from Capitol Hill. And apostolic journey. Pope Francis prepares to attend an interfaith meeting in Kazakhstan and to visit its resilient Catholics. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, September 12th, 2022. Thank you so much for being with us tonight on this feast of the holy name of Mary. I'm Tracy Sable. Pope Francis is among those paying tribute to a missionary sister who was murdered by terrorists in Mozambique last week. Sister Maria de Copi served in the country for nearly 60 years. Yesterday, the Holy Father prayed for the missionary. Also, in yesterday's Angelus address, the Holy Father noted that God suffers if we are distant and waits for our return. Sempre Dio ci aspetta a braccia aperte. Pope Francis reminded the faithful that God is our Father who comes in search of us whenever we are lost. The Holy Father also encouraged Catholics to show others the same closeness, compassion, and tenderness that God has for us. Meantime, Pope Francis's 38th apostolic journey is set to start tomorrow. The Holy Father will tra travel to Kazakhstan for his third international trip in 2022. The Pope visited the Basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome today ahead of his visit. Although the Central Asian country is home to a small Catholic community, just 1% of the population. EWTN Vatican producer Alexei Gostovsky has more. Tomorrow, the Holy Father is traveling to Kazakhstan to take part in an interreligious meeting on the role of religion in a post-pandemic world. He is also going to visit a small Catholic minority, which is just 1% out of nearly 19 million inhabitants who mostly profess Islam. But who are these Catholics of Kazakhstan? Yes, for Metropolitan Archbishop Tomasz Peta, Kazakh Catholics have experienced much suffering here, but now live a triumph of faith. In Spask, near the city of Karaganda, dozens of monuments recall a terrible past of the people who suffered here under the Soviet regime. However, the atheistic regime collapsed, and now a rock of faith triumphs in Kazakhstan. In Kazakhstan, uh, c'è una storia. Adelio De Loro, the Bishop of Karaganda, witnessed the growth and development of Catholic Church after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And over these 30 years, Kazakhstan even got a native bishop, Bishop Evgeny Zinkovsky, a descendant of deported families. The bishop says now many Catholics have left Kazakhstan and gone to live in Europe in search of a better life. However, the faith is growing among locals. Sister Alma takes us to the lower church to introduce us to the first statue of the Virgin Mary in national Kazakh dress. Sister Alma explains that Mary is the one who brings Jesus to the local people. This is why she has one foot in front of the other, because she is on the move. Another important milestone in the development of the Catholic Church in Kazakhstan was the creation in 1994 of a Catholic seminary in Karaganda. The new rector, Father Ruslan Rahim Berlinov, is the first priest of Kazakh ethnicity and alumni of the seminary. Father Ruslan says that the students of the seminary are not coming only from Kazakhstan, but from Russia, Georgia and Belarus. Since its beginning, more than 20 priests have graduated from the seminary. And the presence of the seminary gives a great hope for the development of the whole church in the Central Asian region. This year, the Holy See decided to merge the national bishop conferences of several Central Asian countries into one sole bishop's conference headquartered in Kazakhstan. 
So, the visit of the Holy Father in Kazakhstan is an event significant for the Catholics in Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Mongolia and Afghanistan. 40,000 pilgrims are expected to greet the Holy Father. In Kazakhstan, Alexey Gotovsky, EWT News Nightly. A service of thanksgiving takes place at St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, Scotland, in memory of Queen Elizabeth II. The public is now being allowed to pay their respects at the late Queen's coffin. The state funeral will be, will be held next Monday at Westminster Abbey. As the UK says goodbye, the world is also marking a change in the monarch. She set an example of selfless duty, which, with God's help and your counsels, I am resolved faithfully to follow. In a speech to about 900 members of Parliament and the House of Lords, the new king promised to continue the Queen's dedicated service to her people. King Charles III started a four-nation tour of the United Kingdom today. And this weekend, a surprise public reunion for the Prince and Princess of Wales and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Prince William and Prince Harry, along with their wives, Catherine and Meghan, greeted people who were in Windsor to remember the Queen. Tensions between the brothers have reportedly remained high since Harry and Meghan stepped down from senior royal duties. While the Biden administration creates more controversy today with its handling of gender issues and abortion. But President Joe Biden's day started with another topic, infrastructure. He says money is on the way for America's airports. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, President Biden flew to Boston today touting the bipartisan infrastructure law. First destination, Logan International Airport. Before heading for Boston, President Joe Biden tells reporters, We're going to be spending a lot of money, we're going to get it done quickly, and we're going to go all through America making our airports the best in the world again. After that, on to the Kennedy Library. And at the library, we're going to be talking about my commitment to defeating cancer. This is a, all the way back in 62, the moonshot was announced. We're going to have a moonshot for cancer, for real. We're going to cure cancer over time. I'm going to lay out how we're going to do that. Meanwhile, today is the last day to submit comments to the Department of Education for the controversial proposal to add gender identity and sexual orientation to Title IX. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops calls on Americans to respond, writing, This will require schools to comply with gender ideology, affecting many of the day-to-day -day activities of these institutions. Schools could be punished for distinguishing between boys and girls in locker rooms and dorms, adding, The regulation's definition of discrimination on the basis of sex would also include termination of pregnancy. This could be used to impose requirements that promote abortion. Back at the White House, two more gatherings to promote abortion. Second gentleman Douglas Emhoff was set to host the National Council of Jewish Women, while Vice President Kamala Harris planned to welcome, quote, civil rights and reproductive rights leaders to discuss the fight to secure reproductive justice for all. Pro-life groups continue to push back. Students for Life recently wrote an open letter to the vice president saying, if pro-abortion politicians are going to promise to protect women, they need to protect all women, including those who are pro-life and pre-born. Now back to Title IX, U.S. bishops also say the proposed regulation just goes too far and that fairness between the sexes does not mean acting as if boys and girls are absolutely the same. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. And we go now to Angela Morabito, spokesperson for the Defense of Freedom Institute and former press secretary for the Department of Education. Angela, welcome back. Always great to see you. Um, as Owen just reported, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops is among the groups speaking out against the White House's Title IX proposals. Uh, what parts of the measure do you think are particularly worrying for the faithful? Well, Tracy, it's great to see you as well, but I wish I had better news to share because the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops is exactly right 
there is a lot that is problematic about this Title IX proposed rule, um, starting with the fact that the Biden administration wants to define, redefine the word sex and instead make it gender identity. They're trying to change the definition of the word. Their proposed rule also strips away some really important due process protections for all students, and it would require schools to step in when a student or, or staff member is refusing to use someone's preferred pronoun repeatedly. Uh, it, it turns gender ideology into law if this thing ends up, ends up going forward. And Angela, I understand uh, during the public comments period ending today that there have been more than 175,000 public comments so far. Uh, clearly, it seems this is something that's a concern to a lot of people. Um, let's talk more about that. And also, what impact, if any, do you think these comments will have? Well, the American people are fired up about this. In fact, I just checked before we went live, and it's now at over 184,000 comments. So people are, are really interested in this. And it's, it's fascinating to me, in part because I served in the Trump administration. And when we announced the 2020 Title IX rule, which is currently in force, we broke the record. We got 124,000 comments. And the mainstream press called us radicals. They called it extreme. They called it a bunch of names I will not repeat on television. But this thing was just everywhere. And now that record has been shattered by the Biden and Cardona rule. And the mainstream press seemingly has nothing to say about it. But the American public sees what's in this rule, and they are having none of it. And to answer the second part of your question, the department is required by law to consider the comments that it receives. So when your comment gets sent to the Department of Education, they have to take a look at it and they have to address these comments in the preamble to the final rule. So knowing that parents and families are, are so invested in getting rid of this rule's misguided provisions uh, actually gives me a lot of hope that we could get some substantial concessions from the administration, uh, hoping that they will back off many of the provisions of what they've proposed. And Angela, we have probably about a minute or so left, but I know there's a case that you have been following uh, about a teacher in Ireland who recently was suspended for language that he used in the classroom. Uh, can you tell us more about that and why you say this sort of case could soon happen here? I can. It's, tr it's tremendously sad. There's a teacher in Ireland who was suspended when he repeatedly questioned a policy that would have required school staff to use students' preferred names and pronouns. He said that violated his, his right to religious freedom, though he's, of course, abroad in, in, in Ireland. But the school ultimately suspended him. He was enjoined by a court not to go on school property. He did anyway in protest, and he is now behind bars as a result. In fact, just a couple hours ago, he, he lost... Uh, an effort in court today to try and get himself out of prison. So he is still there. And, and this may seem like a far off idea, but it really shows you the harm that can be done when the federal government gets involved in gender identity politics. I think this is a, a horrifying example of, of just why small government is so important and why the federal government really should have no role in things like names and pronouns. Well, Angela, we're going to leave it right there. Thank you so much, as always, for weighing in. Always appreciate your insights. Thank you so much, Tracy. Coming up, a report about the distribution of abortion pills to teenagers without parental consent. And a whistleblower warns about evacuees from Afghanistan now in the U.S. who could be potential terrorists. A new report says an online clinic is offering abortion pills to women in five U.S. states even before they are pregnant. The Washington Examiner says the pills are part of the provider's, quote, advanced provision program. In four states, the pills are available to women and girls starting at age 15. In all five states, parental consent is not required. And we go now to Jessica Anderson, executive director at Heritage Action. Jessica, welcome back. Great to be with you. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the story and what states are these pills available and how easy would it be for a woman to acquire them? 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for having me and shedding light on this incredibly important development in the fight to protect life across the country post jobs. I think what we're seeing with this story is states like New Mexico that are offering uh, these pills to women, to young girls 15 years or younger, is really showing the real intent of the pro-abortion movement and how radical they are, that they want to take away the most intimate form of motherhood, of having a baby, before, before you're even at the point where the baby's in the delivery room. They're treating birth as if it was just some other medical condition that needed to be fixed or addressed uh, with these pills before the baby's even at 10 weeks. So it's radical, it's extreme, it's disappointing, um, and it's frustrating to see states uh, like New Mexico take this on full head, uh, and especially without parental consent. Oh, absolutely. And let's talk about the risks, you know, with these pills and the implications uh, to a woman's health, both physical and mental. Well, that's right. And, and frankly, uh, the science and the medicine hasn't even um, gone so far as to expose the long-term damage that taking pills like this could have to a woman on the mental side. The physical side, we know it right away, which is that it completely destroys and, and aborts the pregnancy, the life of the um, unborn in a woman's um, utero. But then you've got the mental aspect where you're literally taking abortion pills as if it were candy or as if it was Advil or Tylenol to fix a headache. You're completely dehumanizing and separating the very existence of motherhood from the baby. And so um, that impact on a woman's mental health, certainly uh, her impact on her physical health, those damages are longstanding. They're not to be celebrated. And they're certainly something that I think generations of women that are exposed to this are going to have to deal with year after year after year. And certainly when it finally comes around that they decide that they want to have a baby, then they're left with the pain and the harsh reality that they've aborted babies before. Absolutely. And, you know, I want to go back to that parental consent again, you know, not needed for these abortion pills. Uh, it's really interesting because I believe nearly every state as well as D.C. has statutory laws that require a person to be 18 to get a tattoo. And even if you want to get your ears pierced, you still need parental consent if you're underage. Uh, however, parents are cut out of this process when it comes to these abortion pills, and they're dangerous and also potentially life-threatening. Yeah, that's right. You know, the movement from the left to further separate parents from their children, we're seeing it in the issue of life and the pro-abortion advocates. We're seeing it with transgender treatments and grooming of children in schools. We're seeing it with critical race theory. I mean, it, it's, it's across the social and cultural spectrum right now. And it really just goes back to the fact that the state wants to own your kids. They don't want parents making decisions in concert for what's best for their children. And so when you remove parental consent from one of the most intimate choices, like having a child and bringing a child into this world, you're further separating that linkage of family. And as we all know, families really are the bedrock to American society. They're one of our most important American institutions. And it's incredibly disconcerting that you would have, a, you would have healthcare companies under the guise of women's health go in and, and basically promote these um, abortive feed pills to young children as young as 15 without parental consent, uh, when you can't even get an ID, driver's license permit, drink, vote, anything like that um, until you're at least 18 and certainly with parental consent in some of those instances. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of horrifying. Almost out of time, but I quickly want to talk about this tweet um, that you put out uh, last week. Uh, you wrote in part, quote, conservatives in California, Illinois, Maine, and New Mexico need to take note. Um, so what can be done to counter these abortion pill programs? Well, state lawmakers and certainly governors can actually put the restraints um, in their state to require parental consent or to flat out say that these bills cannot be sent in, in state post offices or delivered to minors or even outlawed in the state. And we've started to see some success from this with conservative lawmakers at the state level, conservative governors pushing back on the abortion pill giants. And I think a lot of the 
pro-abortion movement is actually going to head in this direction with telemedicine and sending these pills across state lines through the U.S. Postal Service. And so we're really calling on all conservative lawmakers to stand up for the unborn, to stand up for true women's health care for, for women everywhere, support life protections at the state level, especially in this post-Dobbs era with more and more states that are grappling with, are they going to be part of the abortion regime and the abortion giant? Or are they going to protect life from those most vulnerable? I hope more are going to land on the latter. And that's what we're calling conservative lawmakers to do beginning today. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about all this. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Our Ukraine claims a swift counteroffensive has forced Russian troops to retreat from its northeast region near Kharkiv. A Ukrainian spokesman reports many captured prisoners of war. Meanwhile, Russia says its second day of shelling has caused heavy damage in the same area. <laughs> A court in Pakistan extends bail for its former prime minister, Imran Khan, was accused of terrorism after a speech last month which allegedly threatened authorities. Khan was ousted from parliament last April. He remains popular despite the government's desire to press the case. Up next, a dire warning about unvetted Afghan evacuees in the U.S. who pose a potential terrorist threat. Plus... America remembers the solemn anniversary of the 9-11 terror attacks. Well, as we remember the 21st anniversary of the 9-11 terror attacks and one year after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, a whistleblower reveals some startling news. Afghan refugees were not properly vetted when they were evacuated to the United States, and some were on the terrorist watch list. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with more. Eric? Well, good evening, Tracy. You know, I've learned the Department of Defense whistleblower has, in fact, brought evidence to both Senators Ron Johnson and Josh Hawley. Now, some of that evidence has, in fact, been turned over to the Department of Defense Inspector General. Now, Senator Hawley says he reviewed that evidence and he found it just shocking. As many as 324 men and women who are on the terror watch list were brought over from Afghanistan are now on U.S. soil and their whereabouts are unknown. We all remember these pictures from last August of the Biden administration's botched withdrawal from Afghanistan. Those trying to get out of the country ran alongside or even clinged on to military transport planes leaving Kabul. Some held on to the planes while they took off, eventually falling to their deaths. In this letter obtained by EWTN News Nightly, Senators Josh Hawley and Ron Johnson asked acting DOD Inspector Sean O'Donnell to investigate allegations that, quote, 324 individuals evacuated from Afghanistan were allowed to enter the United States, despite appearing on the DOD's biometrically enabled watch list. The list identifies individuals determined by analysis to be threats or potential threats to national security, including known suspected terrorists. The whistleblower also gave evidence showing, quote, political appointees at the National Security Council and DOD instructed agency personnel to cut corners when processing evacuees in Afghanistan. We've just been lied to by this administration over and over. They said oh, we followed the vetting procedures. No, they haven't. Uh, they said we did in-person interviews. No, they didn't in the vast majority of cases. We know that for a fact now. And now it seems that uh, there are potentially hundreds of terrorists. Senator Hawley tells me Congress needs to act now, and the FBI, who's in charge of finding these known terrorists, must chase down these individuals. We could literally have another 9-11. You think about it, it only took a handful of hijackers for 9-11. I mean, we're talking about 300-plus people. Uh, it's just unconscionable. As we know, today is uh, Afghanistan is back under Taliban rule, and that means that women and children's rights have been stripped, in particular young girls. They're not allowed to go to school anymore. Now, Senator Hawley, along with 22 other Republicans, have introduced another bill to 
create a task force within the State Department to try and get the Americans that are still there in Afghanistan out of the country. It's estimated around 200 are still in Afghanistan. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN, News Nightly. And finally tonight, as mentioned, yesterday marked the 21st anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. The nation honored the nearly 3,000 lives lost on that tragic day, including a message from President Joe Biden. A moment of silence in New York City on a somber Sunday, 21 years after the September 11th terrorist attacks. When al-Qaeda hijackers flew airlines into the Twin Towers, the Pentagon, and a field near Shanksville, Pennsylvania, killing nearly 3,000 people. It should not take another tragedy to unite our nation. At the September 11th memorial in New York City, family and friends read the names of their loved ones. Howard Lee Kane, Jennifer Lynn Kane. Firefighter Vincent D. Kane, Engine 22. While at the Pentagon, President Joe Biden attended a wreath-laying ceremony where he paid tribute to those killed there. This is a day not only to remember, but a day of renewal and resolve for each and every American. The president also referenced the drone strike, which killed Ayman al-Zawari earlier this year, saying the al-Qaeda terrorist leader would never threaten the American people again. The president also shared what he sees as the greatest lesson learned from 9-11. Regain the light by reaching out to one another and finding something all too rare, a true sense of national unity. To me, that's the greatest lesson of September 11. On the anniversary of a day we will never forget. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.